Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, all of the above. Thanks for joining another exciting episode of Coffee and Commerce. Super excited to have our host, our, our guest rather, although I think he's going to turn into our host in a minute. <laughs> the Chief Brand Officer for uh, Gymshark, Noel Mack. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Zubin. This is uh, it's an honor. Uh, mate, we've got to start with the question that everybody wants to know. Did you get your haircut for the show or did you get it for another reason? Two things. First of all, can we all appreciate the fact that he said mate because he's a, he's a pro rarity in my Britishness, which is dope. Um, and then I use dope to, you know, to fit in with you guys. Yeah, to do the same um, thing. <laughs> the the hair got a regular occurrence. One of my uh, one of my guys dropped out of his slot and, uh, and he, he hit me up and said he's got a slot and I could make it. So that was, uh, that was me. So I'd love to say I got the haircut for you, man, but no, I'm afraid not. We look fresh, so uh, thank you regardless. <laughs> thank you to your friend for dropping out. That's okay. um, no, we got so much to talk about. So many questions have come in. Um, just like I said, we're really privileged and honored to have you here. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, which are probably few and far between, uh, Noel and the team at Gymshark are kind of the, the, the North Star of most e-commerce direct-to-consumer brands, what they've been able to do in such a short period of time, how they've been able to maintain kind of sustainable growth uh, is just phenomenal. And so we're going to get to hear from the man uh, today. Before we get into Gymshark, let's go back a little bit. Talk to us about Noel as a child, Noel growing up, music, your passions, all that stuff, and what led you to Gymshark. You, so Zubin sent me a, a thing a thing beforehand saying some of the stuff we talk about and he wrote music on there and when I was watching the Laurel Paddlepod episode I was looking in the background saying can I see a Les Paul there and I was trying to figure <laughs> out what the body you had so you and me I feel like we, we, we can talk about music for a little while um, sure. but yeah um, not I feel like there's not a huge amount to tell to be completely honest but uh, me as a kid I feel like I've, I, I've, I've definitely got an ego right and that's that for, for in some ways, that's a bad thing, and it can play out in some horrendous ways. I'm sure you've experienced that in your career. But then it also makes you pretty driven as well. And I think I've always been willing to work really hard. My dad was an extremely hard worker growing up. Granddad, extremely hard worker. Um, Irish immigrants family, so you know that you know that thing of the 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 work ethic that gets passed down. Yep. Um, so yeah, that was me growing up. Music, again, probably another Irish thing, like. So, uh, the, the songs I remember from when I was a kid, like old traditional Irish songs, never even heard them, but they've just been passed down to the family. And then that kind of translated to me playing instruments. And up until university, I thought that's what I wanted to be, a session musician. And uh, and yeah, I, I played keys, played guitar, drums, loads of other stuff like that. Always, I was gigging, I, was, I moved to London, I was doing the music thing down there. And But it, it, was, it was doing that at university where I fell in love with, I, I love the marketing side of the music industry, genuinely blew me away. I, I still think to this day that those are some of the, the smartest marketeers I've ever come across in the way they, the way they tap into culture. And I know at the forefront of culture, right? in fact, they build culture. And I think a lot of brands like us are just sort of playing catch up with some of the stuff that they're pioneering. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, music and marketing and culture, that, that, that all kicked off for me at university while I thought I was there to go and be this session musician. But I think I moved down to London and uh, and I, I felt pretty good where I'm from in Birmingham. And then when I moved down to London, I got there and I was like, oh my God, I'm terrible. All these guys are so much better than me. Luckily, I found this other thing, which I, I, I was really into. Um, started an agency that went on like 18, 19 years old and literally did that up until Gymshark. Gymshark came along to me as a client. Um, at, at my agency that I started with my friend when we were young, uh, and they were, you know, these they were these guys with, you know, not much budget, not not much idea. The first brief they ever sent me was the funniest thing you've ever seen. But this is in like year one of trading, and they 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 were they knew they were onto something. What year was this? Twenty thirteen, I want to say. So like the sort of the second year of Jim Sharp, maybe. Um, but um, yeah, they, they sent me this brief for content, and you, you know what? I, I, I sort of I, I mess with Ben on this now, and I'm going to talk about when I first met him, saying he had you know no idea and no budget. But they did, they did have an idea because I remember them coming to me and saying, "We just need content," and I was like, "What do you mean you just need content? Content because content's going to be the thing." And I was like, "Okay." And then I asked for a brief, and there was just no brief, and it was just content, just just roll cameras, take pictures, create content for us, and we were like, "Okay, cool, let's let's do that then." But they, they were right, right, they were ahead of the curve. And then, um, yeah, so that they go from just, you know, this one project with us through to like 10 days of the working month um, was all on this Gymshark account. 
And then one day Ben kind of comes along and says, uh, yeah, I feel like you should bring what you're doing in-house and we should build this this brand thing, this creative, this uh, yeah, this brand marketing thing that you've got in-house at Gymshark. So um, Cheryl Sandberg said, if the rocket ship's taking off, don't worry about the seat, just fucking get on. So I got on the rocket ship and it was the best decision I made, I think. That's amazing. What year was that? I've been at Gymshark now for coming up to four years. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, so... I think the reason why it's important, I think, for people to understand kind of your background, music, marketing, etc., is because everybody's got a passion, right? But yeah. seldom do they actually take that and manifest it into something. So many of the questions we get all the time now uh, from budding entrepreneurs are like, and frankly, from everybody around the world, is like, okay, e commerce. All of a sudden, due to what's happened over the last few months, e commerce is like, front and center in everyone's mind, even though it's been around for a long time. And now everybody's like, how do I get into e-commerce? How do I get into e-commerce? And the reality is it's like, you're not getting into e-commerce. You're getting into building something. And the channel just happens to be, the hot channel happens to be e-commerce, but it's not just about e-commerce, right? It's about figuring out what that passion is. How do you lean into it? So, and I think it's 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 really fascinating. You're talking about content, right? Because we talk about content all the time. And the fact that to build a brand, you need content. Mm-hmm. let's go into that a little bit let's talk about the content what were you guys doing with the content back in like 13 to what you were doing in 16 17 with it back then so the stuff that i the, the stuff that i made for gymshark the very first sort of pieces of content they ever put out as a brand was for me it was just standard i mean i was doing some cool work and i was flying around the world and we were working with some really cool brands to be honest with the agency we only ever really did cool like cool work that we wanted to do and gymshark has seen that and asked me to do the same for them so i, I knew nothing about the fitness industry came along we shot some like documentary style, style content but i think there's a there's an important i, I want to come onto this more later on with like you said the growth of e-commerce but different cultures i feel like are in different stages we came along, and I made for Gymshark what I thought was some some cool content. It was, you know, it was great, but it was hardly groundbreaking, right? It wasn't Christopher Nolan. It was, it was just, you know, it was some, yeah, that, that's a nice piece of YouTube content, and it blew up in the fitness industry, right? And the the the, the fans and the YouTube comments, oh my god, oh my god, like Gymshark leading the way, smashing it, this and all that. So I'm thinking, what the hell, like, why? And then I quickly realised when I did some sort of scouting around, the fitness industry hadn't seen yet much great content, right? I mean, these days. You've got fitness influencers who not only look amazing and are incredible athletes in their own right, they've also got the Sony A7S, the gimbal, the Rode video mic, and they're producing this 4K 120 frames per second, beautiful cool. content. And that, that's that's only been that's, that's only been a thing in the past couple of years, right? So I feel like we were just sort of we pioneered some of the some of the good content early on in the fitness industry, basically. Versus what we're doing today, to be honest, we've gone completely the other way. Like we have. The, the, the creative team at Gymshark is unbelievable, right? One of the, I think if they were an agency, they'd be one of the best creative agencies in the UK and they certainly be competing with the world. We have, you know, the red cameras, we shoot the 8K stuff on the cinema lenses and super high production value. But most of the stuff that we're making is this scrappy TikTok, like show it to somebody over the age of 35 and they're like, why the hell is that working? And it was like, you wouldn't understand unless you were part of this culture, unless you yeah. spend your time on social media like our guys do. So, it's almost kind of gone the other way. It's gone full circle. One of our best ever, um, one of our best ever performing pieces of content cost us. I mean, if I had to add it, add it up, it would be under five hundred pounds because it was just some compilation stuff that we put together from loads of different clips over the years, and it was one of the proudest pieces that I've ever. Uh, on, one of the proudest pieces I've ever seen come out of Gymshark, and I know a lot of the guys in the creative team feel the same way. So yeah, it's kind of gone full circle. What's the theme, right? So you you produce. Uh, Again, back to content and the fact that you need a shitload of content and you need a lot of shitload of branded content. Right. You, you're talking about red cameras, you're talking about things that are kind of not attainable for most people. And yeah. yet you talk about the most impactful piece of content is something that was under 500 pounds. Yeah. So what's the theme? How do, you, how do you do that? How do you plan for that? A fierce understanding of the platform, right? So literally, you joked at the start about me being in the barbershop earlier. The guys in the barbershop were saying to me, no, what camera should I get? Because I want to get the page for the barbershop popping, right? And they were talking about this full frame Canon thing and the Sigma lenses and whatever else. And I was like, yeah, yeah. no, I was like, go on that. I was like, go on the Gymshark page right now. Because they're only asking me this because Gymshark, right? So go on the Gymshark page, 5 million followers on our main account or whatever it is. And I was like, show me a piece of content on there that was shot on a like DSLR or a proper camera. I said, like, it's all iPhone. Although like, it's got nothing to do with it. And people always fall into this trap, I feel like, at the start of the game, right? Thinking... Um, that they put almost these barriers to entries in front of themselves. Okay, I need to get this camera. I need to get that. I need to get that. I need to get that. Man, 
Gary's the Gary's the ultimate advocate, right? I just start fucking making stuff and just start yeah. putting it out there in the world. And I always say, like, I feel like the way you deliver the content and the if you can hit up on a niche and if you can find something that works, a little thing for you, is so much more important than you know the production value of the content. So if you go back to like 13, you're producing content as an agency. Yeah, you're growing that. In 16, you talk to Ben, you come on board. Uh, how has that content morphed? And what I'm trying to lean into is not the technical side of it, but the yeah. brand side of it. When yeah, you're yeah. making content, when you're thinking of content, when you're putting up shit on a board and saying, let's make this, yeah. what is that? What is that theme? And then how do you plan all that stuff out? So like we have, it's almost like, if you, if you imagine it's like a priority list, right? We have like priorities along the bottom. These are our like non-negotiables, right? This is the, the Gymshark ethos, the values, the things that are just true of Gymshark. Priority number two is, now, which network is it going out on? Because you remember the days where the social media manager or the social media strategy was take the same piece of content, the 16 by 9, that you shot long form for YouTube, and you just cut it down in all these different resolutions, sizes, yeah. and lengths, and just hammer the same shit everywhere, right? It's so different now for us. It's like, as long as you're abiding by those ethos, those values, those brand non-negotiables at the bottom, you can kind of do what the fuck you want within your channel, right? So what you're putting on Pinterest can look completely different to what you're putting on TikTok, completely different to what's going on Instagram, completely different to what's going on Facebook, right? But that channel-first approach is so, so important to what we do now. The way Jim Sharp talk on Twitter versus the way Jim Sharp talk on like Instagram are wholly different, but it's because we know what works for the audience on Twitter now and we know what works for the audience on Instagram. So unless it's a real big hero campaign that we want to spread across like every single channel and spread a one to sync message at once, Generally, I don't want to describe it as a free for all, but our guys who, you know, these channel owners are given real creative freedom. And like I said, as long as they don't mess with that thing on the bottom. So, what are the things at the bottom? So, you know, um, aspirational. So, it's always Jim Shark's a brand that you, we need you to look to. We need you to look to our, our, our page and go, that's inspiring, man. Like, I want to get out there and work out, right? Yeah. Whether it's whether that's through driving music, whether that's through seeing your favorite influencers, whether that's seeing some amazing feet of conditioning that you're like, wow, I need to, you know, I need to get out there and sort of get healthy. Uh, I think it's mental health as well. Like, a, we have a huge focus on mental health these days because so many people, including our influencers, there's one in particular. I always tell this story. She's, she's the way she looks is incredible, right? She looks Amazonian. Like I feel every time I look at her, I feel guilty because I'm like, oh, God, why do I look so terrible compared to her, right? But when you talk to her about training, she always says like. I don't train to look like she's. Like, I don't. I don't look in the mirror and go. Oh, I need to work on my abs or my delts. She's like, I love the way training makes me feel, like the endorphins it gives me, and the way you know my mental state after lifting. She's like, all this is just sort of a happy byproduct, if that makes sense. And I love that. And we found that. I don't think when. I don't think when Ben started making stringer vests in his mom's garage like seven eight years ago, he thought we would be this sort of mental health advocate brand. But they're so intrinsically linked that that's a, that's become a huge part of what we want to stand for. Um, Working hard, staying humble is always a huge thing for us. Like we're not really into the, you know, do you remember, do you remember the early days of Instagram where everyone that was popping on Instagram, it was like the days of like Alexis Wren and Jay Alvarez and those guys. And it was always yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Insta goals, right? It was like the Maldives. Yeah. It was shredded, tanned, Lamborghini, yep. all that kind of stuff. Whereas now it's become so much, I think people almost got sick of that. And now people get so much more respect for being real online. So that's a huge thing for us as well, showing that, you know, it's not just the, the Steve Cooks and the Whitney Simmons. These are some of our athletes, on, you know, who are already the finished product. It's also showing those guys on the journey as well. That goes, that goes really well for us. And we always want to be able to show that. And then I suppose finally just inclusivity like that, because we're so value driven. We want to, we want as many people as possible to feel at home on, you know, Jim Sharks, social media networks within our communities. Um, so, you know, we, we, we just signed a guy called Rob Kearney. He, I, I actually, the first time we spotted him was because I was watching Joe Rogan's podcast. And Rob on Instagram calls himself the world's strongest gay, right? And, it, and like, I, I loved how unapolo unapologetically gay this guy was, right? Rainbow Mohican in a sport, like strongman, which is so stereotypically sort of like, you know, masculine and heterosexual and all that stuff. And Rob was just the most disruptive competitor I've ever seen in that. And I remember hitting up Callum, who's our like, head of sponsorship. And I was like, Cal, this guy's unbelievable. We've got to get him on board. Um, we've got transgender athletes on our roster now. We're working with podcasters. We're working with esports guys. And you know, I mean, I don't know, but I, I'm guessing if if I was in the boardroom at some of our larger competitors based around maybe Portland, Oregon, I feel like I would have a real fight on my hands to prove why an esports ambassador might be a good idea. 
that's not a thing at Gymshark. Like we, we understand that we, we, we've got a guy called Ethan here in the UK who's like he went on this he went on this transformation from like being what people would stereotypically think an esports gamer looks like through to like running the London Marathon. And that journey inspired so many kids to get into fitness. Well, of course you're welcome at Gymshark. Do you know what I'm saying? So community driving our values, that working hard, staying humble thing, because we don't want to drop into that old Insta goals kind of thing. So yep. yeah, it's, uh, I mean, we don't, we don't have a, we don't have like a, you know, a war cry and a, and a statement of, of every single thing, but it's a, it's a vibe that I think our community definitely get from us. And it's something that our staff and especially the channel owners absolutely know. How long did it take to get to that point where you're like, okay, like these are the three things that matter to us. And these are the values that we're going to make sure because uh, to your point, it's not just a matter of content, right? We're just focusing on content, but I'm sure those three ethos carry through everything you do from talent hiring to uh, athletes and, and other individuals that you want to partner with yeah, yeah, for sure. content, everything it goes across the board. So how long did it take to get to that point? And then what advice do you have for others that are starting out right now? How can they get to a point where they actually understand what matters to them? For us, I think, com I think community from literally the beginning, because mm -hmm. The way I describe Jim Shark, and this is a this is a, a weird one, so bear with me, is we're very similar to the early skateboard brands. So like there was this new subculture, this emerging thing that was skateboarding, it's kind of reckless, and they didn't really know what it was. And you know, the Nikes, the Under Armors, the Adidas of the world were they, they were creating sportswear, right? That wasn't the stuff that the skateboarders were wearing. The skateboarders were kind of kind of hip-hop culture, but sort of not as well. And they were in between this thing, and then like the Patters and the Stussies and those guys were the first brands that stood up and went, hey. We represent you and what you're about. And they went, love it, right? And now, look, there's some of the... We wouldn't have Kith if it wasn't for those brands, right, I believe. Totally. Um, so they stood up and represented a subculture for the first time. That is exactly what Gymshark did as well, right? So you had, you had again, like elite sportswear over here. You had Venice Beach, Gold's Gym, huge dudes, you know, bald, massive, oversized, all that flannel wear, all that kind of stuff. And in between, you had these, like, new generation of kids, like the aesthetic era, who were... They were getting in great shape, but with a T-shirt on, you wouldn't know they were anything, you know, some crazy gym guy, but they were looking after their uh, their body. They were learning how to lift properly. They were tracking their protein, fats, yep. and carbs. And again, they felt like there wasn't really a brand out there that represented them. Jim Sharp stood up and went, we represent what you guys are about, right? And they just clung onto it. So community, so that was a you know a subculture and a community. We claim that community, and they've been with us ever since. There are brands that came six months after Jim Sharp, twelve months after Jim Sharp, who did literally the exact same thing, created the same products, marketed in the same ways. Often we're even trying to use the same influencers as us, and it didn't work because it was that moment, that first mover advantage that Jim Sharp got, which is so 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 important. So community been a value from the start. I think some of the other values that we picked up along the way, we've had to learn. Um, I think if you if you were to scroll back, it'd take you a long time all the way back to you know the start of Gymshark. We probably were doing that Insta goals thing, but we've kind of again the great thing about having the community is they've led us. So like you know maybe the, maybe the engagement started to drop on those posts a little bit, or maybe there was a comment here and there saying yo guys this is dope, but you know how about including some pictures of us sort of you know yeah. more you know curvy around the edge guys, and we go oh, okay yeah, cool. Yeah. So it's this amazing it's this amazing circular economy where. The community, we do things for the community. They have feedback based on that. We sort of take that away, absorb that, bring it back around and go, okay, how about this? And they go, yeah, that's dope as well. Do you know what I'm saying? And this is what I'm talking about. This is what's led us into the podcast stuff. This is what's led us into getting involved in the LGBTQ thing. Uh, this is what's led us into, you know, um, our staunch stance on the George Floyd murder. These are all things that we've been led by our community on because sure, there's things that we're passionate about. But at the end of the day, if it's important to our community, it's important to us. So We've just been there's a, there's a there's a there's a quote that always gets brought to the uh, you know, I always get see on Twitter or wherever it is that I said in an interview with um, Shopify Plus not long ago it was me and Ben and they kept talking to us about like how good our marketing was and I sort of not stopped the guy but I said what you need to understand is me and Ben aren't like great marketeers we're great listeners there's a difference right and in that way it kind of makes the job feel really easy so going back to what you said at the beginning about um, how you know fledgling e-commerce businesses can do the same thing how they can find those values it's just open your ears and be a really fucking good listener basically and then also the only other thing i say is you need to prioritize those values as well because these days totally. it, i think the, the brands that try to be all things to all people right and yeah. just put themselves exactly. everywhere and be everything to everyone won't succeed in 2020 and moving forward we're seeing a lot of brands who've previously done that now trying to turn that huge ship and go another way and try and get more values driven so i think you need to find out what your values are. And the easiest way, I think, is to, you know, put stuff out there and just listen, test and learn. But I think that, yeah, to your point, the thing that's interesting is that 
you've got large behemoth companies, right? Enterprise organizations that can't shift. Like they hear and they hear a lot, but there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of signals. They can't even shift to it, even if they wanted to, because organizationally they can't. Then you've got organizations on completely the other side that are starting out and it's, it's a new brand coming up. And I think the key is at that point, understanding who you are, because look, at the end of the day, a brand is a reflection of the individuals that start it. And then what happens in the case of Gymshark is if you do a great job of building that community and you're not even building, it, you're really activating a community that's out there. And then you listen to that community. And then all of a sudden that community takes ownership in the brand. Mm -hmm. And when they wear that piece or they put that thing on, they feel like they're part of the community and their voice matters. And they actually feel like they own the brand in a sense. Right. Yeah, 100%. But, but you start with that point where you're like, this is what I personally stand for. This is what I want to build. And I think there's a, there's a distinct point at, at, at when you're starting out to know what that is, as opposed to, just being a me too brand. And look, you could be a me too brand and you're going to be small and there's going to be a point. It's more of like a small lifestyle brand situation. But if you want to achieve like hyper growth, yeah. like Gymshark, you have to know what you stand for, believe in that, get others to contribute to it and do something different. And this is what I feel like this is what you're saying, the exact same thing that Robbie Deeks was saying in that viral Twitter thread that he, he, uh, that he yep. wrote where he said there's so many econ brands now that aren't that you know if they if they were to turn their ads off then sales fall off a cliff as well it's a to totally. too brand like you said just now but like i suppose i suppose in a way like can you call those e-commerce brands or those e-commerce businesses right because the way i see it they're not really building like brands brands right because yeah. there's no values they're not listening to the community all those what kind of things. brand mean to you no talk to us about brand well you cut me off there man that was a, that was a, with a great question as well <laughs> that messed me up man um Okay, so do you remember in Starbucks back in the day where everybody was working away, right? And they all had those black Dell or HP yep. plastic laptops that sounded like yep. they were going to take off and everyone was sat away tapping away, right? One guy or girl comes in with the MacBook, right? And they bring it out and there's almost like a, oh shit. Like, and there's, there's almost an understanding. It's like, well, you, you must do something quite cool then, right? You... Yeah. You, you're probably a video editor or a writer or a movie director or just something totally. pretty slick. And there's almost like there was a reverence that, you know, that, that having that MacBook had. Yeah. Um, to me, that's what I'm trying to do with Gymshark, right? So, like, pre Gymshark, I'd go to the gym in whatever was clean, whatever was in the drawer, didn't care, uncoordinated, whatever, right? Like, my dad has owned shorts for longer than he's had me, and he will wear those to the gym, right? And, though, and I feel like the gym is full of those, especially guys full of those people but what i'm trying to build up is this thing where when you see that gym shark guy or that gym shark girl in the gym a bit like the macbook it's oh shit and straight away it's universally understood what they're about right and this is what brand is right it's seeing that logo or the word gym shark and straight away understanding all the stuff that that is you know that that guy or girl probably knows all about nutrition you know that, that guy or girl probably knows exactly like if you were going to ask someone for advice on your squat technique you're probably going to go over to the guy or girl where you shark right because they know what they're doing um and then when maybe you delve a little bit deeper and you, if you own some gym shark you probably know about some of the values that they uphold as well because you've bought into gym shark and like i always say when you purchase gym shark you make a vote for us as a brand right it's not just getting the product sure we make great products but i think it's a lot bigger than that and that's the reason why when Deeks is talking about all this organic hype that we can drive and all that kind of stuff, I don't think that I don't think that always comes down to product. I think a lot of that is driven by values and people want to vote for us. They look in Ben's eyes on Ben's YouTube videos and they think, "Wow, this kid's cool. I like the mission these guys are on," and they want to back that. No, that, that that's brilliant. I think the the next level of what you mentioned and and it kind of gives us a transition point to what's going on over the last few months of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. The next level of what you mentioned is the fact that. You don't only wear, okay, so now a lot of people are working out at home, right? Mm -hmm. But even if you're working out at home, when you put that piece of whatever on, you feel activated. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden, like you're in that zone and you're ready to work out. Did, right? you ever do like, that thing? Did you ever do that thing when you were a kid where your mom or dad or whoever bought you some new, I'm going to say sneakers, not trainers, they bought you some new sneakers and you were convinced you could run faster in them? Yep, absolutely. That that's that's been Ben's MO. Absolutely. He was 19 years old. He was like, Absolutely. when I, I want people when they pull that Gym Shark stuff on to think, surely I can bench twice what I was benching yesterday. Now I've got this Gym Shark top on. And you're right, it is a feeling and it's an emotion and it's you know it's, it's fairly undescribable. But if you've ever been to a Gym Shark event, if you've scrolled through our Instagram page, if you've 
probably just put the product on. Yeah. You probably know what I'm talking about. So the thing is, like, we're, we work at home, right? Like, taking this, like, beyond just working out. You work at home. You don't need to kind of dress up aside from, like, video calls and whatnot. But, like, for me, if I'm not wearing, like, my trainers, sneakers, whatever, when I work out, I just don't feel comfortable. Like, I don't feel like I'm in peak performance. Mm -hmm. Like, even today for you, I put on my Nike Sakai Waffle uh, trainers. I'm like, I got a, for Noel Mac, for those of you that don't know, this guy's a, like, uh, guru sneaker. I'm not, uh, definitely not a guru, but I appreciate the sentiment. Well, yeah, but if somebody follows you on Instagram, I, you, you, don't, you have no idea how many people have messaged me with the, uh, your post the other day with the Nike uh, sneakers you were wearing, and they're which, asking oh, me what those oh, are. And oh. I have no fucking clue what those are. Which, which one? I don't know which they one you're wearing. Uh, they were white with uh, like a... These. No, no, not those. Those are amazing, though. Those, those are amazing. That's a whole other story right there. Anyway, like, anyway. It's, 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 my, point it's, it's, is, yeah, yeah. my point is, you want to get locked in, right? And it goes back to your point about mental health and, and not only mental health, but the mental preparation and mental focus you need, right? Mm -hmm. I love the, the quote. I don't know who said it first, but how you do one thing is how you do everything. Yeah. And it's like, you've got to get mentally locked in, right? So you're talking about Gymshark clothing. It's not just a matter of wearing it in the gym. Somebody sees you, what it stands for. Those people are doing it for themselves because of what it activates within them. And I think that's a really like, that's a fascinating thing. But the reason why that happens, I think, is because you look back at like the, the Instagram videos of five, 10 years ago, where it's like somebody on the beach and you're like, oh, I want to go to the Maldives or I want to go to Bali or whatever it is. Those things give you like momentary happiness. Mm -hmm. And then you find things that are like more sustainable happiness in your life. And it could be working out. It could be spending time with friends and family, whatever. And then those things become real. And when you can take your brand and improve someone's real world and, and not like their travel time a week, a, a year or whatever the fuck it is, mm -hmm. when you can actually impact them in their homes, I think you've kind of transcended that ability to build a relationship with that Man, yeah, and I wish, I wish, because so, we did so many events over the years, I wish I was able to take you to some of them and look into some of these kids' eyes and some of the stories they've told us because you, you're, you're so right. And it's it's really strange. I always said I wish, because our company's a huge company now, I wish every single employee got the chance to visit some of the trade shows or the pop-up stores we did over the years and got to see the impact they're having because, like you said, I, there, there are people who I, I don't want to get into particular cases but there are people who've had the worst medical conditions you can possibly think of who've said mm -hmm. what got them through that was Gymshark was training was the content we put out was our athletes all that kind of stuff and in a way you almost don't want to believe them and you're like no it's not be stupid we're just a bunch of kids trying to run an e-commerce business over in Somewheresville UK right like surely not but once once you've heard your hundredth story like that you kind of have to start believing it but um, there's one of our athletes who's in a wheelchair and she's, I'm not, again, I don't want to get into her story, but she openly talks about what some of our athletes and what our brand did for her. And it's one of the most inspiring stories I've ever heard. And she talked about how, you know, as a lot of people do when they find themselves in a hospital bed situation, she was having some pretty dark thoughts. And she decided to sort of take destiny into her own hands and use fitness as a way to, to sort of claw out of that space. And then, like, when we heard the story, she was almost like a fan of the brand. And then she was just working and working. She'd tell her story on social media. And today she's a Gymshark athlete because it was such a ridiculously inspiring story. So, again, you, you're, you're so right on that. And we've heard it so many times over the years. And we, we like to think that, you know, through Soph, that, that there'll be a bunch of other girls who might be in a similarly dark place after her, after her. And they see her. They see us shine a light on her. And they see her shine a light on us. And they see that that's what we're about. And maybe they can, you know, experience the same thing. But, yeah, you're right, man. I think we definitely do. But there, there definitely is a feeling day to day in GSHQ that in some weird way we are changing the world. That's brilliant. Uh, Noel, let's get a little bit tactical with the folks that are watching. So obviously, and it, well, it's not obvious for many people, the way you market and position a brand now is different than it was done two years ago, four years ago, eight years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Years ago, 
and 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 I really want to lean in on this and get your POV on this. But years ago, it was all about return on ad spend. Just run a bunch of ads on Instagram, Facebook, Google, etc. Get yeah. some sales. Just immediate um, ROAS and, and CAC and whatnot. Talk to us a little bit about how that's changed. What would your advice have been four years ago to a brand starting out? And what is your advice today? It's hard because it was so it was a different space for us back then. But at this at this Shopify, I was at um I was at Commerce Plus in New York with Shopify mm -hmm. and talking to those guys. And there was a bunch of obviously e-com brands in the audience and there was questions rolling in and people were saying like Oh, it was it was a lot easier for you guys because you know when you guys got to Instagram there was still organic reach there was still this there was still that and one of the guys who asked me that question I said yeah you know what you're absolutely right it was what's your TikTok look like and he's like huh and I was like how's how's your TikTok game and he was like oh, I haven't really uh, yeah I haven't really. and it was like you're looking at Gymshark and trying to trying to duplicate exactly what we did right. And I never, ever think that's a good idea. Like never, even if you're trying to make a fitness brand, I don't think it's a good idea to copy exactly what Gymshark did. If I was an e-commerce brand out there, what I'd be trying to copy is the way we think as opposed to what we do. Do you know what I'm saying? So we didn't, Ben didn't sit there in the early days and go, you know, I think the return on ad spend from some of these guys on YouTube, because bear in mind, they weren't influencers at the time, could be yeah. you know, exponential and so on and so forth. And they, he wasn't breaking into those typical, he wasn't talking about cost of acquisition, right? He understood the culture. He understood the touch points really well. Now, admittedly, that's because he was the customer, right? He was the 19-year-old watching these dudes on YouTube, and he just thought, from his own opinion, this would be cool. Um, so I, th I feel like I wouldn't get too hung up on those things. If you find yourself obsessed with ROAS and cost of acquisition, I feel like you've gone too deep. Like, we, 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 were, we weren't there. We weren't talking about these things until years into the Gymshark journey because, first, there was just so much understanding of the audience to be done, that fierce understanding. So that guy that day who asked me about Instagram, he didn't even know whether his audience was on TikTok or not, but he should absolutely know that. Do you know what I mean? Because when we we joined it when it was called Musical.ly, and there was, we, I already felt like we were late to the party. I mean, now, obviously, we're one of the bigger brands on TikTok. But... Um, yeah, just fierce understanding of the consumer from the start and don't get too hung up on the traditional econ metrics because I feel like you can get blinded by those and become too obsessed with them. One of the questions that I got on LinkedIn when I said I was doing this, there was a guy who was in very early in his e-commerce career and he was talking about the fact that his cost of acquisition seemed really high. And I was, I was feeling like, I feel like you've got a long way to go before you even start yeah. worrying about your cost of acquisition yet. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, Gary talks about like the lemonade stand sort of mentality and just speaking to people. Like, don't go straight to Facebook ads and just start hammering money. I feel like there's, there's there's other ways to try and gain traction for your brand at the start. So, yeah. So tell us about some of those other ways. Like if, if you were to someone, uh, there are a lot of people that ask this question, but like starting right now, um, what would you advise them to do? Like how, how would you look at a direct -to consumer business? Like in the first 12 to 18 months, where would you focus? Right. If, if I was starting one right now, I'll tell you what I'd do. Yeah. I mentioned earlier on, right? When we joined the when we joined the fitness game, the content wasn't great, right? Nobody had really started to evolve the content in the fitness thing. Mm -hmm. The influencers hadn't started to really make that much money yet, right? They were still just guys and girls on YouTube who were sharing their workouts, getting some views, and they were kind of doing it for the love more than anything, right? So when when the guys first reached out to them, it was uh, it was again I'm sounding really commercial now. I don't mean it to, but it was it was basically free, right? And influencer marketing wasn't a thing. It was it was just yeah. it was reaching out to guys who had a few subscribers. Um, I see other industries now that are in the exact same place. Like I, I, something else I missed was there's there's generally a lot of major players who haven't noticed this social media revolution going on, right? And that's what I think. If you if you'd have pitched the Jim Shark business to a traditional investor, if you'd have gone on um, Shark Tank or Dragon's Den uh, all those years back and said, "Got this idea for a brand," they would have said, "You're never going to compete with the big guys. Get out." Yep. But they didn't know what the 19 year olds knew. Do you know what I'm saying? So I've seen motorbike helmet brands do it recently i've seen hair product brands do it recently and i'm looking and realizing there's there's moto vloggers doing these motorbike vlogs and i can tell from their content they're not making much money yet do you know what i'm saying and i'm looking at the the products that these old motorbike helmet brands are putting out and i'm thinking 
yeah, there, there's, there's a gap there for sure. And the, there's no real social media brands in that. And, I, and there's, there's definitely space there for that to happen. I've seen hair pro- and male hair products do the exact same thing. You have these huge old brands that have been doing it the same way yep. uh, for a long time. And there's been no real sort of social media revolution. I can tell the influencers in the game aren't really making much money yet. And I've, I've been trying to identify one of those. So rather than coming along to the fitness industry now and trying to start your gym brand, when you've already got the gym sharks and you've got 50 other brands that are inspired by gym shark who like we said earlier have just sort of done the me too thing i'd be looking at industries where i thought that feels like what gym shark sort of not not stumbled upon but um that took advantage of when the fitness industry hadn't got there yet so i, th- I think that would be step one and then from there i think again in, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely be reaching out to influencers as quickly as possible even if just for business advice from them and saying you know what other brands are you working with who you're talking to, what content performs the best, because that will shape your content as well. And just start diving into communities. I think there is there is absolute gold in Instagram comments, and I don't think people realize that. Talk everybody wants to, everybody wants to run a, a huge brand deep dive. I'm talking bigger brands now. They want to use these big brand deep dives. They want to do um, you know these like audience panels and stuff like that. Um, but I, I feel like just spend some time. I spend so much of my time trawling through Gymshark Instagram comments. I'm not replying to any of them, but I'm just finding out things that our community is saying. We've got a Facebook. We've got a Facebook community page, and I'm I'm the number one stalker in that page. And I'll, I've always got my finger on the pulse of what our community are feeling about you know any campaign, anything like that. So even if there is a brand out there that you know you think you're going to start your wax candle brand, you admire this other wax candle brand, hang out in their comments, right? Figure out where you think that brand's going wrong. Oh, they're missing a trick there. They're missing that there. They're missing that there. I think people have done that to us in some ways over the years and have started great brands, admittedly smaller because they're a bit younger than us, but in places where we might have, you know, missed certain elements of things that our community were crying out for and maybe we didn't take it serious enough. So that's what I'd be doing if I was starting fresh right now. I think I think that's a, that's a really fresh perspective because, yes, there is a lot of – well, First of all, communicating with people, you'll be surprised at what kind of response you get. So uh, to Noel's point, if you're going to go out and you're starting your uh, hair product company um, for men, as an example, go out and communicate with those influencers. Ask them what they're using. I mean, you'll be surprised at how many people actually respond to you. But I think the next part is really interesting what you mentioned. So not necessarily to speak, but to listen. So if you go out there and you're starting a male hairline product, pick the top 10, 15 that you admire or aspire to be or whatever, and just go read their comments. I think that is such an understated opportunity. Well, look, wait, look, what we talked about earlier, right? you're talking about ROAS and cost of acquisition, right? Yeah. I, I hadn't thought about it the way you just said it, but that's brands trying to speak way too early. They're just trying to shout, but they're not listening. I love that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I think... The advice then isn't a matter of go out there and do a whole bunch of shit to begin with. Go out there, do a lot of listening, Mm -hmm. and then start doing stuff. And and really the key is, see the irony here is that we talk to big brands. We talk to brands that are large, brands that are uh, about to go into hyper growth. And we tell every single one of them it's a content game. And, And you have to have meaningful content that's out there that gets somebody to go shit, makes them feel something, right? And the, and, and the interesting thing is Noel's talking about that at the early stage, right? So he's saying like, don't go out there and just start running some ads, which if you want to do tests and whatever, do it. But focus that money on content and, and focus it on relationships. And and because look, you're either going to pay somebody for their time or you're going to give it, pay them uh, in other ways and merchandise and whatnot. But the key is build that community, find that community, give them a different reason to activate with you. Let's talk about something you mentioned a little bit earlier about the fact that your brand team has kind of carte blanche to do whatever they want to do on these channels as long as they adhere to those three ethos. How do you see the role of the main channels that are out there right now and how you interact with your consumer on those channels? How do I see the role of them? I think I, yeah. I, I don't think they I don't think they um or like within the psyche of the consumer. Yeah, yeah. I, th- right? I, I think it, I think it entirely depends on the age, uh, the age as well. Because like, like I I feel as though, and this is just personal. Twitter is the king of social networks, right? Now, yep. th- th- there's a ton of metrics which would say otherwise. But for me, in terms of just genuine conversations, content, they they've almost they 
Twitter's ruined the news for me because now I go to Twitter for my news instead, right? It's not CNBC, Same. it's not BBC, Same. it's not anything yeah. on Twitter. Um, it's been, I also think it's been the most consistent, right? Like Zucks has famously, you know, just tweaked and messed with Facebook, you know, and changed it into different things and then realized that and then stripped it back and then all this stuff. Instagram from what it was at the beginning to what it is now is such a different place. Twitter is pretty much the exact same thing it was when it started, right? So I feel like that's the kind of reign champ. So if I wanted, going back to what we talked about earlier, if I wanted sort of um, just solid insight, which I knew wasn't built on sort of the latest social media trend, that's where I'd go. So I'll give you an example. We went to Toronto and we got it wrong completely with a pop-up store, right? Basically, we drastically underestimated how strong our community was in Toronto. So we did the pop-up store. It was crazy cold. We got this huge warehouse and then there was like a, a, like a something like a 19-hour line around the block. And although that sounds great, right? And that sounds supreme and kith and all that, all that stuff that's not good when you're trying to run a community brand right because we literally we're the staff are out there in their coats buying coffee donuts for the guys i'm so sorry like we're going to try and get you in and then you go to a certain point where we have to say to people realistically at this point you're not going to get into the store and you've got people there who literally there's one girl who flew from texas who flew five hours to come didn't get into the store stood freezing her ass off all day long right and then flew home to texas now again we're a community brand i'm happy to tell you that that girl now works for us in denver colorado so <laughs> and i met her at the manchester store and we bought her in and i got to hang out, hang out the athletes and all that kind of stuff so we will always put those things right but we got it, we got it wrong there first thing i do is get go on twitter and search the word gym shark not at Gymshark, I don't want to see what people are saying in the mentions. Yep. I want to say what people are saying about our brand when we're not in the room, right? So I'm just searching for the word Gymshark, looking for these people going, Gymshark, this is bullshit. I do not like this. She was one of those guys. In fact, I'm not sure if she tweeted it, if her brother tweeted it saying, this is bullshit. My sister had flown to Texas, blah, 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 blah. So straight away, I'm DMing that dude. Yo, so sorry, man. It was, you guys turned up for us. Do you know what I'm saying? Because it was, it was good in a way. It was like the, we were way more loved in Canada than we thought we were. But Twitter right. is just such a great tool for that. So for me, Twitter will be, you know, the reigning champ. But equally, I know my niece does not mess with Twitter. And I know TikTok is everything to her. And the whole da, 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 is everything to her. Do you know what I'm saying? So that, that was so cringe. I can't believe I just did that. But you see what I'm saying? I feel like it's horses for courses. It's, it's like um, it's customer touch points. And, and, and you just need to figure out who that audience is. Whether because for some brands out there, if you're starting a, um, if you're starting a, uh, what's it called, like a sludge brand, right? Um, then maybe Twitter's not for you because it, you don't yeah. what you need there in solid opinions. What you need is viral TikTok videos. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you need to that that's 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 a, a, a really powerful weapon for you that wouldn't be for other brands. So I don't think there's, I don't think they. Well, they have these defined roles. I don't think everybody has to be on everyone. I don't think you have to pick your horse and kind of back it depending on what works for your business. Brilliant. No, let's uh, jump into questions. We got a ton of questions. Uh, Seth, do you mind just throwing a first one up there? Brilliant. So Val VRJ asks, what marketing strategies can you implement for Amazon Shopify to gain more customer traction against sellers that undercut you in terms of price and social proof and have lower quality products? Obviously, the main focus is brand building, but doesn't seem enough. Wow. I don't know whether that's more of a question for you or me because... You can't really, because we're D2C, you can't get Gymshark from anywhere else. You can't actually buy the same product. I suppose I can answer that slightly in the way that we have a ton of copycat brands that have, you know, reached yeah. out to suppliers and sent our product to them in terms of sampling them. And you can probably get those for, you know, 5 or $10 less than you can get ours for. We're going back to what I said earlier. Those brands don't stand for what Gymshark stand for, right? When, when COVID-19 happened, those brands took their money and, and hid, right? when COVID-19 happened with us, we were paying PTs. We've got the biggest fitness influencers in the world. We didn't need to pay PTs to do live stream workouts for us, but we did that because we wanted to give back to the, you know, the personal trainers in the industry. We were raising money for the NHS. George Floyd were donating to Black Lives Matter. There's all these things, like I said, I think people vote for Gymshark. So I'm not sure what your individual case was, Val, but like for us, brand building kind of is enough to, to, to stop those guys, not to stop them, but to, to, to make sure that doesn't have a huge impact on us as a company. How about you, Zubin? Yeah. You got experience with that. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with you. And I think that, look, when you think about it, I think that the question isn't a matter of what marketing strategies, but it's more a matter of like what content strategies, right? Like lean yeah. back into content. Why is somebody going to buy from you versus somebody else? If it's a commoditized product and it's a pen versus a pen and it's going to do the same thing, you got to do a lot more, right? Like there's no actual, if you have no actual innovation in your product, yeah. then there's got to be a reason that someone's going to want to write with this pen and feel like when they write when this pen 
they have more power or so it gives them an ability to write or whatever that is, right? Like you got to lean into that and figure out why your brand exists and what content can you create so that somebody wants to be a part of your community. And I think that like, if you could sum it up for Gymshark, that's really the key, right? People want to be part of that community. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can go buy a knockoff and, and you might have the same performance when you're out running and whatever, but you don't feel the same way you do when you put that on. And I think mm -hmm. that's the key there. All right, next question comes in from Dylan Dijam, UCLA medical student. If you were to start your brand over from scratch during the pandemic right now, what are the top things you would focus your time and dollars on? And would your business model incorporate anything else beyond just e-commerce? And then he corrected himself and said pounds, which I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> and he got mates on the end of it as well. Um, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I think we sort of already focused that. I focused my time in figuring out what what are the holes? What are the what are the what are the other brands not solving for these people right now? Um, I think Nike did that with the with the uh, the Metcon shoe in CrossFit. Reebok had been only CrossFit for so long, and I think Nike came along and just they just did loads of little bits of insight. Oh, why is that quite not working? They bring out the Nike Metcon, and the Nike Metcon goes you know goes crazy. Um, so even the big brands are doing it right. But I feel like again, if I was you. Again, I don't, I'm not sure what your, your product or your, your, your brand might be, but I would be just trying to figure out what are the problems that the other brands aren't solving. Solve those for them. Have those conversations. And like, like Zuma said, you'll probably find that they're going to you over those other products eventually. Brilliant. Next question comes in from Andre NACV. What's your analysis of WhatsApp marketing? I don't know how it is in the US, but in some countries, sales, deliveries, and customer service through WhatsApp is tremendously increasing without third-party apps. Man, I'm 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 all in. I'm I'm a big fan of it. Like a big fan. You know, what I'm a big fan of. I'm a big fan of anything that when you mention it, people go, "No, nah, it's bullshit. It's not going to work." So it's like bricks and mortars that right now as well, right? Because of what's happening, and there's all these huge bricks and mortar brands pulling out. Mm. People are like, "No, nah, bricks and mortar. Like you've got to go digital now. You've got to go digital." Well, I suppose I'm a bit of a I'm, I'm in a luxury position that we're already digital. But that, if anything, that makes me go. Uh, I think there's something in this Rick, Rick and Mortar thing. And it's the, if you mention SMS or, you know, if the guy said WhatsApp, SMS marketing to anyone. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's the same in the US, but everyone goes, SMS marketing, like Domino's, because Domino's will text you here and be like, hey, do you yeah. want pizzas? And it's seen as like trashy, like, you know, like seriously terrible marketing. That makes me think there is definitely something in it. And I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my cards quite, quite close to my chest on this one, but I've been, I've been, uh, I've been speaking to some econ players and speaking to Shopify and a few other brands and they've been doing some test and learn with it, which it seriously interests me. I think it goes back to as well, like I'm not sure what your opinion of it is, but you know that thing of like if you can take away friction then in, in, in a purchase, why would you not do it? And I feel like everybody thinks to take away friction, you have to have developers trying to get a three-click checkout, a two-click checkout, a one-click checkout. There is more than one way to skin a cat, right? Oh, SMS yeah. and WhatsApp could provide an even more frictionless experience for your consumer if, you, if you're creative with it and you, you apply some lateral thinking and try to figure it out because everyone else is ignoring it, in my opinion. Two thoughts. One, when you're starting out, and you want to leverage uh, SMS and whatnot, you want to give value to those people that are getting it. So like two years ago, the best use case of that was like when you order something and you're like, okay, when is it going to arrive? And they were sending you shipping updates and you were excited to get it. Mm -hmm. um, drops, things like that, that you can basically say, look, this is limited availability. Um, come on right now. Because the key is everyone's got their phone on them, right? They might not have push notifications on email, plus they get a thousand emails. So you want to be in their um, SMS inbox. But the third thing that I think, or the second thing, whatever the fuck the number is, that, that's important is friction. Like go, and Gary talks about wine text all the time. So a lot of people know about wine. Go to winetext.com. Mm -hmm. um, sign up if you like wine, but if you don't, just check this out. It's brilliant. You go in, you put in your information, you put in your credit card information. It's all secured. And then all you do is they text you every day and they say, this wine's available at a discount. All you got to do is respond with the number of bottles you want. They already have your shipping address. They already have your credit card. They process it all. It comes in. It is the most frictionless system that exists. And the reason why it's great is because it's exciting. It comes in your inbox as something special. You take a look at it. But like when I get that text, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And I think that works for those brands that you really love, right? And you dig, you like their values. Exactly. I don't think you want Amazon texting you saying, hey, no. new cat litter, because you're like, what the fuck, that, that, that is Domino's, right? But if it's the it, terrible example, if it is that brand that you love, right, and they text you and go, you know that thing that you couldn't get last month, well, now it's here, yeah. we've got your size, do you want it? And you text back, yes, boom, and then the next day it's at your house. Frictionless. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't have anything. Yeah, to if, 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 if Gymshark was starting tomorrow, because we're so community based, I would probably start in a, a WhatsApp group for literally all customers. And that would be called the Gymshark community. Obviously, we can't do that now because we have millions in our community. Like, all sure. over the world. But if, it, if I was a young, scrappy startup, I'd be, I'd be adding people. I'd be in those comments that going. That is a brilliant brilliant point because you're giving those early people vip access to the brand so everybody's talking about oh let's get better connectivity fuck just get everybody that's part of the brand to begin with give them early access get them in a group Mm -hmm. send them the product for what it costs you and say what would you like to improve about this brilliant uh richard azoles asks if it's all pay to play on google adwords the highest bidder how does a small underfunded site get noticed I feel like I've been talking about this since the beginning. I know, it's like, like yeah. it, 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 this just keeps going around. But let me give you know what? I'm, I, I never like talking about numbers really because I feel it feels a little bit like arrogant or like I'm showing off or whatever else. But for this particular question, just to drive this message home, um, we did our summer sale uh, like a month or so ago. Uh, we, we, to be honest, our resting heart rate of our business has been going so well. We didn't need to put a sale on at all. It was kind of, the reason we did was kind of because, because we normally do a summer style every year, we knew the community expected it from us, right? So we decided to do it, but rather than doing it for seven days, we did it for 24 hours. Um, we sort of decided what would, a good number for us in terms of, you know, finishing strong on the year and all that kind of stuff would be like 700,000 units and 250,000 orders, right? Um, so that's, like without trying to show off, that's quite manageable for us as a business. Like compared to some of the sales we've done in the past, speak to Lauren, speak to Toby, any of those guys about the late nights they've had because of us. And we're very proud of those late nights, right? Um, but me and Ben, obviously Ben was sort of CMO at the time, sort of look at each other and say, well, how do you want to play this? So what we decided to do was just do it entirely organic. We didn't spend a penny on social media, on, on paid media, like literally zero. The way we marketed, let me see if I've got it on my phone right now. The way we marketed this, sale was with two tweets there you go so we tweeted saying can you see that jim if you can hear me i think about you often right because obviously everybody was locked out the gym and then we quote tweeted it and we wrote you can you see that no you know what else we think about a a gym shark sale right so two tweets that was all we did we then got our athletes to repost just the tweets just screenshot the tweet saying we think about a gym shark sale we put the sale live and we did 250,000 orders and 700,000 units in about four hours. Wow. So we, we hit the target in four hours. No money on paid media. So believe me, it's possible. So I'm sure Richard sometimes feels like, you know, it seems so expensive. It's, it's, it's who's got the most cash. It's an arms race. It's, you know, it's like a, it's a pound for pound war. It's really not. If you can tap into that community, if you can make them feel you understand their values like we have over the years, you can do stuff like that just entirely for, 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 for no money at all. I mean, we had a, the, the stock that we had available on the website wasn't amazing. And I'm, I'm Niran, who's our chief commercial officer. I'm sort of, you know, pushing him now to say, we can take this organic thing further. We've had big organic days in the past, but there, we made millions and millions of dollars that day without a penny on paid media. So it, it, Rich, it can definitely be done. And I think the other thing to add is what you mentioned earlier, which is critical, which is like, look, it's not about making money early on. So if you're just starting out, it might be worth paying more to get that customer, activate the customer, do everything else around that. Don't just sell them a product, right? Understand that they're coming into your home when you're when they buy from you and then start giving them, giving them, giving them, giving them. And they become part of your community. And then eventually you get to a point where Gymshark is, right? Like not everyone's going to be able to do that. Not everyone's going to be able to do those numbers. But I think the reason why Noel's mentioning those numbers isn't a matter of the sheer volume, but it's about scale, right? So you get a certain number of followers and you can achieve that. If you have one tenth of that, one one hundredth of that, the same thing is possible, right? But you've got to get the customer to begin with, get that first party data, create a relationship with them, make them feel special, and then they're going to be loyal to your brand. And you're going to be able to do a lot of these things. I love this. I love that I just I just sort of talk shit in a British accent and then you e-commerce it for me. I feel like we could, <laughs> I, feel like we could I could do with you just walking around the office with me, to be honest. No, I think we're going to come up with a new show together. That's why I called you the host earlier. The only problem is I don't drink coffee. I was going to mention this at the beginning. And I, and I also didn't want to bring tea because that's, I'm playing into the British stereotype too much. So really, this is just a commerce show. Well, what is it, like uh, 7 p.m. nearly your time right now? Yeah, no, but I've never, I've, I've, I've never had coffee in my life. No, it's I was just saying you should be drinking something else. Is what my oh, problem. okay. Yeah. All right, I'll get um, All right, last question. What do we got? 
Vinayak Sharma asks, how should I market handicrafts to people in the US using my official website? I've run ads in the past, but that doesn't make that much of impact. Oh, see, the, the, even more so with this one, like, exactly. Try, so, so tr handicrafts, like, try, I, I'd have to see, but trying to run just ads straight away with that, like, I'd be in forums, I would be a forum champion, I'd be in WhatsApp groups, I'd be on Discord, I'd be anywhere that had anything to do with handicrafts, and I'd be the people's champion of that group, and I'd build it up that way long before I even start running ads. Well, yeah, and if you've listened to Noel the whole time, what he's been talking about and what we emphasize is content. What better type of product to build content around than a handicraft? Like the entire journey of how it's made, the impact it has on people's homes, so on, this, that, the other, whatever you're making it for. I mean, I think I would lean in completely into that and share that content. Share your journey. It's, it's so ironic that so many brands out there that are massive brands ended up at some point realizing, oh shit, people need to know how our products are made. And then they went back and made a bunch of bullshit videos about how their products are made just to be like, oh, this is all this, that, the other, yeah. it's organic or whatever the fuck it is. And yet somebody like Vinayak actually has an opportunity to show that journey up front, an authentic journey uh, of how this thing goes from wherever it's coming from to your home. Now that... Brilliant. Um, so today we're going to start something Ecom Spotlight. I want to spotlight a company and please share other companies that you have out there, people that you guys want us to spotlight. I had the uh, the pleasure of speaking with a gentleman this week, Manyang Kerr. Um, he was a lost boy, name given to some 20,000 children, displaced or orphaned by Sudan Civil War in the 1980s. Uh, he lived on his own at a refugee camp in Ethiopia. He was bitten by a snake at a very young age and he was uh, in the kind of hospital not doing well and the only thing that kind of or the, the thing that kept him alive was the thought that he would be able to uh, see his parents again and uh, that hope kept him alive and as he recovered he kept saying the rain will stop and eventually you will see the sunlight through all of that adversity that he faced Manyang eventually saw the sunlight gained access to the U.S. graduated college became a college professor community activist and recently launched 734 coffee and 734, seven degrees north, 34 degrees east, are the coordinates of the refugee camp where he grew up. No way. It's fucking brilliant. I have goosebumps insane. just saying it. So my point is, go out, support them, get into conversation with them. Their coffee is harvested by growers right in the Gambela region of seven degrees north, 34 degrees east. And after it's brought to the U.S., proceeds go right back to scholarships and education programs to refugees in Sudan. I mean, fuck. The adversity that he's faced, the position that he's in right now to give back. I mean, it should just inspire everybody to fucking do something out there and, and, and recognize the fact that they have the ability to help other people. And through these channels, we have that ability. And if you know of other people brands, etc., that are doing something to elevate the human spirit like Man Young is, please share them with us and we'll spotlight them here. That's unbelievable, man. I love that. Noel, absolute pleasure, mate. We'll have to do this again. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. It was an honor. Thank you so much. All right, guys. We'll chatting soon. Appreciate Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Peace.